Hello, my name is Dr. George Machaki, and welcome back to uh, Organizational Behavior. In this series, we're going to be talking about leadership and decision making. Those two are tied together. You cannot be an effective and efficient leader if you don't make any decisions. And sometimes the decisions, as we'll discuss, will be group decisions. Sometimes uh, some of your decisions will have to be on your own. But it depends what you'll find out is how you minimize uh, an unfavorable outcome of the decision you make is by the more information you have. But in reality, you're going to find out it's not, you know, the rational model tells you how to make the decision, but most of your decisions are going to not follow a routine model. They're going to be unique. Those are the ones that you've never experienced before, and it could be a, 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 an opportunity that comes in, or it could be a threat because of some kind of government intervention, or a new competitor coming in, or you have a new product line that may work out for you. And if you look at something that's going on right now with the Samsung uh, a tablet, uh, they're having a little bit of uh, uh, Galaxy 7, uh, excuse me, having a little issues with a... Uh, uh, big issues with uh, what do you call it, the battery starting on fire. So that's something, how do you handle this? Do they have a crisis management? A lot of companies, as we discussed earlier, have a crisis management in place for, they don't know what the crisis is going to be, but when they, if there is a crisis, they have the engineers, they have the suppliers, they have the manufacturers, they have the uh, public relations, that's how you handle it. But that's part of uh, you know, those are your unique decisions, a crisis management decision. So we're, what we're going to talk today, we're going to talk about different types of leaders, uh, attributes and skills. Right now, you know, if you look at our presidential elections, you're looking at the both effective leaders to some extent depending on uh, their expertise. I'm looking into politics. I just want to say, you know what I mean? Uh, taking all, they've got to a level higher than I was got. They've got to a level. They must be able to make some decisions uh, depending. Now the problem is now, could they make the decisions, uh, uh, how you make a decision for a business or in a different uh, uh, function that you were within the government, could you now be able to be that individual makes the decisions for the whole country and lead them? You know, are you a, a, a charismatic leader? Or are you, uh, you know, how do your leaders, uh, uh, leadership uh, to the eyes follow, uh, follow you, okay? So when you really look at this, there's a lot you're going to learn today. Okay, so remember, this is a summarization, so let's get going. Real quickly, quick overview of leadership, and remember, it's a little different than we talked about management. Management is a title. If I look at that management, I got different managerial level. I'm a senior management, a vice president, I'm a, a, a supervisory level, a title, a functionality, a part of an office. Leadership is the person who takes that title and is able to bring the team with the vision and everything else the management is coming up and now be able to communicate to their employees, to their colleagues, to their shareholders, or to their uh, uh, supervisors. This is what leadership is. You know, and we're going to talk about reverent leadership, we're going to talk reward, power. You know, you, you, uh, when you have that title, you get some legitimate power. But that's only part of it. Just because you got the power, but you don't have any respect. You don't have that... Uh, uh, that following, that charisma. The power is only going to get you so much. So you have to use more of a force power or a reward power, and that's not the most effective way of um, changing people's heart, leading a country, or leading a, a company, or even a department. So the process, I'm not, now I'm going to make this bigger. Remember, you already got the concept, man, we discussed this. I'm just giving you the finalization. So in, just like in marketing, we planted the seeds, you read the book, you did uh, interactive uh, software from the publisher, we discussed this in class, you did some uh, homework assignments, we uh, were building on your own business plan for your new venture, you know, just like a skeleton right now, just looking at it, or a template, for lack of better words, and going forward. Okay, so now, so all this is just a summarization. So now all the pieces kind of click together. You know? And so you can't, you know, if you just uh, uh, found me on YouTube, you'll get something out of this, all my course. You know, I always get something out of anything I, I look or read. But to get the uh, full effect, you should take the, the class, either with myself or other instructors who teach uh, organizational uh, you know, leadership or decision making. Okay, so let's see. Now we're going to make this at 150. I think that was a pretty good uh, view. Okay, so here we go. I know, uh, right? Now, so leadership is the process and behaviors used by someone such as a manager to motivate, inspire, and influence the behavior of others. Yeah, that's not too bad. Uh, you know, what does that tell me? 
I get people, I get things done. I'm the one who says, hey, I'm the motivator, I'm the coach. Let's move along here. Okay, now distinction between management and leadership figure. Now, when you look at your book, and here's the figure, okay? I'll make this just a little bigger. I already had this, but yeah. So you look at management, you know, planning, organizing, leading, controlling. Those are functionalities. Now, who makes it happen? Uh, setting the agenda, aligning the organization, it's organizing, inspiring, leadership, motivating. I could, you know, force people, but I use the marketing approach. It's better to tell them, here's why this is beneficial for you it's beneficial for the organization you get more than compliance you get people who get a, a buy-in and they're, they're able to uh, uh, make it happen they're more creative they're more risk takers and, and that's what you need for an organization okay and then monitoring and it's controlling how do you monitor i look at the reports i, I talk to people i go out on the job site i can see you know and, and we'll talk about different things you know, uh, intuition and you know different ways of uh, monitoring and different ways a leader uh, should be able to utilize all his or her senses and i'm very much an intuition intuition kind of gives me like a you know sometimes you have that feeling something's not right all that is a red flag i may be just over uh, uh analyzing it or just something happened earlier and just kind of I, I, I connect the pieces but it, but it's just something i should focus in on that's all it is that intuitive and then you know don't uh, uh and then when you got enough information you'll be able to act appropriately okay so leadership and power okay so we did that now when i looked at leadership i'm not going to go through it yet legitimate power means the company gave you a power i got a title i'm a superintendent i'm an instructor i got power over uh, whatever you know i mean i'm a, a, a director department head reward power certain uh, positions as a leader i reward people give them promotion give, you know and it's not only money you know i could uh, help them with their job assignments i could open up doors for them that they wouldn't have before and you know and that's a reward you do something for me i'll help you uh, out do you remember leadership and anything else with the employees when you're on the other side of the employees remember it's a two-way street i give you a break i give you this once in a while don't nickel dime me you know what you're talking about hey you know, if i want something oh, you know, it's already overtime hey i gave you this time and I, I gave you the benefit of the doubt give me a few minutes here and there that's how you build relationships. And like I tell the students, if you're going to talk to an instructor or a supervisor as a leader, if they come up in front of a group and they ask me, hey, could I have a day vacation? And a policy says, no, you have to have 24 hours. I'm making this up, okay? Uh, you know, whatever the uh, policy is. If they, that individual brings it up in front of a group, I have to follow the policy because if I give him or her a break, I'm already watering down the effect of the policy, okay? Because there's some consequences with most policy. So what I usually tell the students, talk to the instructor on the side. Some, or the, your uh, boss on the side, sometimes you get the jerks. You know, you know what I mean? But the majority of people, they're helpful. They get to know you, and now they see your point. You know, because most leaders have that, uh, they're able, empathy. They're able to kind of look into your eyes and kind of walk your shoes, so we came that way. So you understand that. But now you don't say, okay, I'll tell you what. I know what the policy is. I'm going to give you a break this time. Or whatever. Now I can negotiate because then it's only your world. It's not the, do you see what I mean? It, it, it keeps the masses in, in line. I'll end it at that. Okay, we discussed that in class. The only coercive part, like it or not, why a lot of people uh, uh, obey the law because they want to get a ticket, or it's more of a compliance with integrity. Okay, now the expert power. See, so these here, this legitimate reward and coercive power are given to me legitimately by my title, by my position, by my uh, uh, status. Uh, you know, I own the company, so I have those. I have those powers. I can hire, I can fire, I can do whatever. Now the next power is the expert power. So this right here, I can get things done. Mostly more by compliance. The reward I can do a little bit. People kind of like you, but once I stop giving the reward, and that could be a reward, could be overtime or additional uh, uh, easier work or uh, uh, something else. But once I stop that, people, you know, you're only your friends as long as you're paying. You know, as long as you got the uh, the uh, uh, resources to kind of help them out. Also, human nature. Okay, but uh, but but I have this as long as I have the uh, the deposition. Now the thing that you have to look at the most effective leader and later on we're going to talk about charisma and everything else but we're just talking basic power expert power power driven from expertise i know the information i'm an expert in it i'm a leader in uh, development so people will look at me he's got all these powers or she has all these powers but he or she has that uh, uh expertise and then reverend power reverend power means to just respect me or they see something in me that's a reflection of a positive attitude or an attribute or something that they respect and they 
executive, someone that they know, peer pressure, or um, uh, other leader, supervisor, or their own values, remember, that they have, and then I'm exhibiting that. So I have that reverent power. Identification towards the leader, you know, he's very imaginative, loyalty and charisma, we'll talk a little bit later. Now, when I look at the earlier approaches to leadership, remember, I'm going, this is live. So I don't stop, uh, like in the classroom, I'll stop, I'll discuss this, but this is just a quick summarization. Sometimes I go past the information, just stop it, record it, go forward, backward, I give you that, you can turn it off. Most of the students are really looking for this. Early approach to leadership were a traits approach. So if I had certain traits, I was taller, I was more masculine. And you know, for the longest time, it says only a male could be a good leader. And I'm just saying to remember, now you find out there's a lot of uh, uh, countries, not the U.S. yet, but the females are very as effective leaders as the male. And, you know, and then later on we'll talk about the different genders when we go in here. And we did talk about that. Okay, so traits. Focuses on identifying essential traits that distinguishes a leader. And that could be intelligence, uh, dominance, self-confidence, energy, knowledge about the job. And your first line supervisor had knowledge about the job but they don't have the ability or haven't been trained how to transfer that knowledge to somebody else. Just because I know it and I can't explain it to you, it gets frustrating for both individuals. So part of going to school and colleges, your community colleges are good for small businesses if you're looking at this because they could focus in, you know, they have one area for uh, uh, just for business to business or you could take a course like you're taking this, this is accredited course at, at the college and you could at for, for lack of better words, you will at least learn what to look out for. Learn what the, uh, uh, what, what are some of the pitfalls. Learn about your own style. Learn how to approach people. Learn what other people. And then remember, there's no one correct way to manage everyone, but it gives you a good idea. It gives you tools and different things. We're all unique. All unique. And because that uniqueness is the effective leader, how do I get everyone to kind of... I can't give everything everything. I can't compromise, I got certain values, but I get everyone to say, I see your point of view and I'll, I'll still follow you. may not be exactly mine, but it's close enough to that uh, uh, so I could work with you. And that's where uh, a leader does when he, he or she brings people together. Okay? So you have the traits. And the next one is uh, focusing on determining what behaviors are employed. And the rest of this is here, the next ones are focused on behaviors from employees. So the traits are, you know, just because I'm tall, because I'm good looking, I'm making it up. I am, though. Well, I'm kidding, okay? Uh, it doesn't make him or her a good leader. They're attractive. I mean, it doesn't hurt it, but they still have to have that charisma. They still have to have the uh, critical thinking skills. They still have to be able to look at the situation and be able to make the decision effectively that affects the majority of people in a positive way for the organization or whatever their uh, leading uh, cause is for. Okay, so now you're looking at tax, uh, uh, tax, tax, tax text uh, uh, focus it's a long day okay uh, certain tasks or oh, task focus remember english is second language for me give me a break i am dyslexic give me a break there and the reason i tell you that not to look for any kind of sympathy or anything else in business all of us have uh, certain shortcomings all of us have certain limitations you know some of us are better speakers some of us are better writers some of us are better communicators but we could always learn to improve on the areas that we're not as strong and some are natural gifts to us so you, you know what I mean so you focus in on those so when I say that is uh, you, you know what I mean uh, not, not to uh, look for sympathy but in business use that when some people look at a um, um, I want to say maybe something slowing you down like dyslexia I look at that as a positive aspect I could do process mapping because I have to see all the parts that have to connect or other people may miss some uh, individual some individuals may have something where they could be very focused you, you know what I mean so they're good accountant good engineers good, very technical or very uh, good for the quality but, you know what I mean so we all but you still have to know you don't want to go to the extreme if you're a leader you have to be able to work in the area because all your employees aren't going to have your expertise your knowledge and your abilities so you have to find the best of all of them and you say he's good at this she's good at this he's good at this she's good at this and and utilize them just like as a wild oiled uh, uh, processes I don't want to say machine because we got feelings. And that's where the behavioral comes in there. So leaders' behavior focuses on uh, how tests should be performed in order to meet certain... Oh, tests. It should be tasks. What the heck am I doing here? Right. Hey, we're live. Remember, if you're doing this uh, 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 live, how tasks should be performed 
in order to meet certain either department goals, organizational goals, strategic goals we discussed earlier, and to achieve certain performance standards. I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger. I think it would be easier. Some of you are on, uh, 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 were mentioning that. There we go. We're mentioning if you're on your smartphone or smart devices, just like myself. Okay, so that's task fo uh, focused uh, leader behavior. Now, employee focused behaviors, how should uh, uh, the task be performed? Oh, here we go. The site. I just read that. Okay. Uh, um, employee focus, uh, focus behavior, focusing on satisfaction, motivation, uh, the well-being of employee. That's part of my uh, appraisal. A lot of leadership, I get the tasks, I get everything else done, but you want to see what's the morale. Because if I keep the morale of my employees, which I don't do anything, it's my employees who basically perform the task. I just give them the opportunity, the resources, and make sure everything is done at the timely fashion, cost effect, all that's everything we talked about, planning, controlling, and organizing. But it's my employees who complete it. So I have to make sure they're happy, they're motivated. To an extent, you know, I'm not going to give away the store or, or the business, but, you know, little things. Like, like we talked about ethics and social responsibility. Why? It's a good thing. It's a good business thing to keep your employees happy. Happy employees, happy uh, uh, customers. When employees are unhappy, usually they like it or not. They kind of give that attitude uh, uh, back to the customer. If they think this is the best thing for the organization, they strive. Hey, I don't want to tarnish the name of the organization because the organization is strong. Okay? Now, situational approach of leadership. Most leadership, my perspective... The author, you know, he's trying to find a balance, you know, they're trying to, he or she, they're trying to find a balance. So right now in this course here, uh, you may say, well, that doesn't make sense. Or just remember, this is just at this level here is just to give you a general overview of how all businesses operate. Now we're just talking about the leadership, one component, you know, we talked about marketing, which going to talk about all the different functionalities of business. Okay. So situational approach. Uh, uh, facility, uh, uh, appropriate leaderhood uh, uh, behavior, uh, f uh, facilitates, is supposed to, yeah, let me get, man, I just leave appropriate behavior. You know, when you're doing my concept maps, it's, it's a good idea. I usually put more words in here. I would go various uh, uh, situation to another. I wouldn't go from one situation, but some individuals, you know, you don't know, you're going to say, oh, geez, it's improper grammar. This is a conceptual map that's just give you triggered. The reading, everything else is in there. Your handouts, your notes, the discussion. These are triggered. You don't need the ands and buts. You need the main concepts. So when you're retaining this information, putting it in long time in memory, you can pull out and all the rest of the stuff will come in. You're studying for exam. You don't need to know the ands and buts real quickly. Boom, boom. I just do more for it's, uh, it's easier for uh, presenting. So understand the concept map. You could highlight this, uh, highlight just the keywords and worry about everything else. I make it for you, but for my own concept maps, if I'd be doing when I was going for my uh, uh, master's and my doctoral, it would be very short, just to the point. Okay? And uh, a lot of times I don't even spell the whole words. I could just abbreviate because it's my abbreviation that I understand what, uh, what it is. Other people may have an issue, but this is my code. This is my how I study. Okay? Okay, so now if I look at the situation, here's a situation, a universal uh, approach. To the, you know, the author talked about both. Prescribed forms of leader behavior. So here's how a leader should behave. A lot of time training, you respect everything else, don't talk about people. And uh, on the uh, universal outcomes and consequences. So they tell you, here, here's general. Remember, I'm not a standard, a stereotyping, I'm generalizing, here's what you should do. Situation approach, basically, my leadership styles, my how I approach it depends on the situation of the inv individual, the situation, the, the ser severity of the, uh, the, the outcome. You know, good or uh, positive, you know, uh, like they talked here, the consequences, elements of the situation, both the leaders and the followers, okay? So that makes it sense. So you adjust the situation, your behavior, your attitude uh, uh, towards what's going on at that time. I'm usually an easygoing, participative uh, manager. If there's something else that's going to be like a, a fight, let's throw it back a word. I go, hey guys, please, let's make friends. Hey, knock it off. Go to your corner. Go to your office. Go here. See me in a minute. You go over there. Shut up. Let's go. You have to take, what happened? I adjusted it. That's not my style, but you have to come in there and take charge. No decision. I mean, it'll be uh, assertive, aggressive, uh, for lack of better words, and very decisive. Tell them exactly what you want them to do. No, let's stop fighting. No, shut up. Sit down. Go over there. You go over there. Sit over there. You go to that office. I'll be there in five minutes. You stay right here. The rest of you, get out of here. That's how you manage. Remember, you have to take the situation. Okay? Okay, now. I got all excited. All right. Now, path code theory is basically a situational model 
up here, direct extension of the expectancy uh, motivation theory. If I look at the expectancy that we talked uh, uh, in our last, uh, uh, cha uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, lesson, you know, motivation, and, you know, we talk about Maslow and everybody else on here. So they, uh, uh, let me just put it on here. Uh, leaders can motivate some uh, employees. Remember, when you learn motivation, how to get people to uh, motivate employees, it's the same techniques you use to motivate customers to buy. Uh, identifying the desired outcomes. You know, you have to identify, if I give them this reward, what I want in, in return, or if I do the punishment, is it affecting the rest of the team? Is it uh, eliminating the consequences I want? Is the punishment too severe or is it too lax? Okay, rewarding them for high performance, attainment of goals and everything else. With the uh, you know, desired outcomes, you got to have the outcomes. We talked about the SMART goals. Remember, specific, uh, measurable, attainable, right? Uh, uh, relevant and timely. I'll keep on bringing that out there because that's important. All your goals have to have those five elements, and then you'll never have any problem. Well, you always have a little issue. Nothing's 100% uh, sure, but you at least thought it through, and you know what you're going to, uh, and the employees understand everything else on there, and everything else will work out well in a timely and relevant manner. So attain the work goals. Okay, now the decision approach tree. When I look at the decision, provides decision rule. A lot of times, look at the decision. Um, if George is coming to late, boom, automatically you send him a doctor, or he gets one day off, or uh, if he has three days um, uh, uh, on a medical leave or whatever, and he needs some kind of note. Look, I'm not saying the negative thing, but those things, most of us been in those situations. If he uh, or she uh, uh, comes to work on time for six months, I may give him something else. Or if this happens, here's how I respond to this kind of a situation. Those are easy. Those are for routine, quick and easy. A lot of your decisions, nice to have them that way, but you won't be able to do it. And look at decision tree approach. It'd be something if your car breaks down, you go, okay, it doesn't start here. This is a battery click. Yes, the lights go on. And you're going through different yes, no scenarios that uh, helps you make decisions. Usually for new supervisors or new employees who are empowered, this helps them out a lot. Okay, now leader member exchange model. Now, if I look at this as the extent to which followers like trust and are loyal to their leader, a determinant of how favorable the situation uh, uh, is for leading. So I'm looking at more how much you trust me. If you trust me, I could get more done. If you don't trust me, you always ask, what's in it for me? What's behind the scene? Uh, you're reading in between the lines. Trust doesn't come overnight. Trust is by working with individuals, by communicating with individuals. Those of you who take me to for, uh, on a face-to-face uh, -face class or even an online class, I'm very active in the forums. I'm very active in the classroom. We do a lot of teamwork, a lot of discussion. In smaller group, I could come in and communicate. Now I'm one-on-one -on, -one on that. You see me more. If you only see me up there in the background, how much trust do you have? He's always there. He's in my space. He's, he's he or she's working with me. They're on my level when I'm talking to them. That's how you get trust. You know, I'm going to spend a little time in the leadership because remember we talked last time about emotional intelligence, uh, part of the motivation. Leadership, you have to have that trust of your employees, and you have to don't say just I'm a leader. Trust me, you have to exhibit that if they tell you something. And sometimes it's a fine line, but you have to uh, earn that trust. Don't think they're going to just give it to you. Not by the the title. Remember, that's part of the reverent power and part of the expertise that they trust that uh, you're not going to lead them astray. And then if you tell them to do this, it's actually going to work that way. <coughs> you can see that a lot of times with younger kids when you say, hey, jump in the water, trust me, I'm going to catch you if they don't know how to swim. They've been in before, I don't know, what if he misses? No, I'll catch you, I'm right here, you're going to fall. It takes a little while for them to trust you or you teach them how to ride a bike. I'm running behind them, I'm going too fast, and then you finally have to let them go. So I guess you kind of loosen your trust a little. When I, now that I'm thinking about it, peace. But it was done in, in the right intent. The end of the study eventually, I was, uh, he knew eventually I was going to let him go when I had faith that he or she was able to go on their own. Okay, transformational leader. Now, when I look at transformational leader, leadership uh, to the eyes of the followers, a set of abilities that allows the leader to re recognize the need for change. Remember, I'm dyslexia, so I could see things that doesn't make sense. I, or an intuitive. You don't have to be dyslexic. You've got that feeling. Something's not, it doesn't seem right. It's not flowing right. Something is, is slowing down. Well, what, what's taking me? Where's my, where's, where's my uh, uh, area that there's the, the, uh, the process is slowing down? What's delaying it? What's going on? What's going on? What could I change? 
Create a vision to guide the change. Here's what's going on. Customers are upset. We change this. We get happier customers. You get less complaints in the call center. You know, just uh, walk them through on this. Uh, and to execute change effectively. Remember, that's a transformational leader. Now, transactional leader. It's kind of close. Remember, forget this. Let me just go this way. So if I'm looking at transformational, I think I got two sun here. Okay, just I just break it off. Well, let me go. Just think of the formational. How am I forming something? And the other one is actional. Compared to management, it's that involves routine regiment activity. So when I look at transactional uh, leadership, I'm rewarding high performers and reprimanding low performance. So I'm just looking at your action. This one here, I'm taking more of like an information for lack of better words. I recognize stuff and I'm transforming. This one here, I'm just looking at your action and I'm trying to change your behavior by a certain cause or a certain response to that action okay now this next one here remember all these leaders don't say i'm this one i'm that one you have to play all the role i'm a little depending on the situation am i more a transformational leader or more of a transactional leader all those are effective leadership so you may have more of a precedence to one way but you have to be able to take which parts of each one of these and, and uh, apply to the situation that's happening okay now comparable to okay now charismatic leader that basically is charisma uh, uh, charisma uh, charisma form of interpersonal uh, interaction inspires and support some people just got the chimera, charisma they talked about uh, Arthur Luther King uh, uh, Mother Teresa I think uh, uh, Pope John the second they're just around them some people that charisma I want to help them I just feel that that uh, humility that that humbleness that uh, or that power or, or something that oh man uh, right you know what I mean something about that individual you're self-confident if I uh, miss Sandberg Cheryl Sandberg uh, if you're in the classroom we discuss that we uh, look at some of our videos excellent speaker a uh, good role model only for women but men you could pick up same thing they're talking about coming to the table how do I address the issue how do I make myself from invisible to visible okay enthusiastic able to clearly communicate vision of how uh, good things could be you know you have Steve Jobs Mary Kay Ash Mary Kay uh, cosmetic civil rights leader we talked about that okay we're doing pretty good here. Uh, we're not doing too bad. Okay, now special issues in leadership. Now they talked about a, a leadership uh, substitute. I don't always have to have to be there. Sometimes I go on vacation because of empowerment or because the people know when I make a decision, I tell them, here's why. They may not agree with it. My leaders inform so they know when I'm not there or when they're in all minds, what is a good decision, business decision. You make different decisions at home with your family, now different decisions for the company or the department or for your own operation. So you still have, but you still got to make decisions. You're, you're taking the, uh, you know, the information you have, you're looking at the risk, you're doing the SWOT analysis, for lack of a better word, strength, weakness, opportunity and threats in your decision and then again you're looking at it uh, again uh, how quickly they have to make the decision and how critical is the decision will the decision become a precedence will this decision help the issue or will this decision make the issue more uh, 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 muddy and for lack of better words who was the cause and effect I help this individual this group of individual will have a negative effect on the other group Welcome to management. Welcome to leadership. Okay, so they, in this one, individual task or organization, and they're talking about the tend not to wait the need for a leader to initiate the direct employee performance. An example here is training individuals' ability, motivation. You train individual role. A lot of times, you got self-managed teams. You don't need a, a manager there. He or she could look over them because they're empowered. Remember, we talked about empowerment last time for motivation. The employee can make certain decisions, critical thinking. They're trained well. And I don't like using the word train. You know, uh, I do consulting uh, uh, business. Uh, uh, you know, I, I rather use the word education because education is you know the knowledge and you could adjust and be flexible. Training, I train the dog, give him, a, uh, give him a reward, he jumps up or she jumps up, rolls over. It's training, but in certain cases I need, like CPI, I need to be training. Respond quickly without thinking. You have to go to a certain action. When I was in the military, they trained us how to do certain things without response. It's second nature. But in most things, you, you know what I mean? So uh, 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 I would think more of education. But okay, we'll leave training for in here i just like this is my pet peeve okay uh, individuals abilities and motivation i don't need a supervisor there okay now leadership neutralizers many factors render leaders behaviors uh, uh and effective uh, no uh, uh, many 
uh, factors render a leader's behaviors and effectiveness. Boy, I'm really in a bad here. Okay, uh, thank goodness for spell check. Always remember, don't turn anything else. Yeah, spell check. I really uh, is a, uh, a pet piece. You turn something in, the technology makes it for you. Okay, norms, group decision, elements of the job, an experienced leader managing a head quality. Look, I'm managing people who have more expertise, more knowledge than I'll ever know. And I'm going to tell them, hey, I want you to do it this way. Yeah, what am I in grade school? That never worked. We already know here as a team. We're the team. Yeah, do you see what I mean? So your uh, uh, authority doesn't make sense because you don't have the reverend power for that organization. Just just saying, just certain things that happen. Just be aware. And in here, uh, leadership neutralizes and substitutes. And here they're talking individual professionalism, ability, knowledge, motivation, uh, experience, training, structured automation, a highly controlled. Uh, let me just go this way so you can see it. Okay, uh, individual factors, job factors, uh, intrinsic satis uh, uh, satisfying, uh, embedded feedback. You get something, you know, uh, uh, a lot of times you do something that tells you, hey, good job, you're on target. If you look at my grandson, plays all those video games, instantly. Why? How do you know you're doing good or bad? You got smiley faces or the reward starts coming up. You know, organizational factor, explicit plans and goals. You know what to do, rigid rules, procedures. I'm not much, you have to have some, not to the extent that that's many. Okay, physical distance between supervisor and subordinate. You want that relationship. I don't want to be close in their face. I don't want to make them uncomfortable, but the space that's comfortable for them. Remember, different cultures want more closenesses than Americans do. I know a lot of uh, Asians, Hispanics, you want me a little, not hugging them all the time. I'm not that close, but a lot closer than the arm's reach. Otherwise, they don't feel they feel comfortable remember you, you have to know each individual has, will let you know the space how do you know if you violate this space they back off or they're looking like this do you violate this space back off a little either you got bad breath or you're just in their space Okay, uh, uh, group performance norms, high level group cohesiveness, group is real uh, tight, uh, uh, group interdependent. I teach like a, a fast track class at one of the community colleges and a lot of colleges have fast track uh, a program for uh, uh, adults. Uh, you know, I mean, so they could get finished uh, in, in the two years, kind of a cohort. And then when you, when, when you as a manager or a teacher come in there, that is a cro uh, group. They may fight within their group, but I'm the only, I'm the new outsider, the new element coming in there. No, no different than me as a manager taking over a new team. The team is together, and now I'm taking over that structure. I have to win their respect and their uh, uh, loyalty, for lack of better words, and trust. And usually a lot of times you'll do that, try to identify the informal leaders, even though they're a pain or not a pain. You know what I mean? Some are, very, uh, uh, some are better than others, for lack of better word, and try to work with him and her just to understand uh, the culture uh, uh, where, where your team is coming from. Once you understand that culture, what buttons irritate them, what happened from the last uh, manager, what worked, then now you start changing uh, some procedures and everything. That's why you're in there. You control the workforce and try to make the process and the procedure more effective and efficient. Okay, what do we got? Changing nature of leadership. Okay, so I got that. Da, 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 neutralize, we got that. Uh, changing... Uh, 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 nature of leadership, leadership, most leaders are now as a coach. So if I'm looking at consulting or teachers, uh, you basically have to help students. I can't fail you all. Not now, but you know what I mean? But some I have to fail because, you know, if you're not doing the homework or anything else, there's no sympathy. You know, you're not taking advantage. You're not doing the work. Psh, out of here next. I'll get somebody else in here. Um, uh, same thing in school. You have to fail. You have to do some work. But uh, uh, my job as a leader, as a manager, is not to fail you, mind is to change your behavior so it's more focused and more aligned with the organization, the goal, the responsibility, the ethics, uh, 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 the brand name, and, and the culture of the, of the, uh, of the company. Now, when they, we talked about gender and leadership. Now, I did a lot in here uh, when in the classroom. I'm very focused because there's more women coming into the leadership. And there's some uh, myths going back and forth. Similar when we go to HR, myths about older people. There's not as many accidents with older people. The only problem is with older people, when they do get hurt, it takes them a little longer to recover. But if I look at the uh, number of accidents, if you have a safe workplace, they're about equal. Okay, More women in management than 10 years ago, uh, still fewer women the top levels we're working on that stereotype of women that they are nurturing supportive concerned for interpersonal uh, relationship trust me I've met a lot of women that are definitely not nurturing that are definitely not supportive and I'm just saying that uh, uh, jokingly but remember 
everyone's different. There's so many out there that you can't just put them in this little box and say everyone's like that. But generally, we just have that notion women are more nurturing. Okay, now men are usually more stereotyping uh, as being viewed as directive, focused on tasks. I'm very emotional, I'm very sensitive, uh, but I have to be that facade because that's what most men leaders are supposed to be like. Is that right or wrong? Is that peer pressure? You tell me. You're going to be in that position. What works for you? I don't want you to change as a leader. Same thing when, I, uh, when you're doing your presentations or you do presentations. I talk quickly. That's why I do these YouTubes so you can slow me down and go forward. I could slow down and I a lot of times do slow down. But a lot of times I get so excited, so enthusiastic. This is my style. So people after a while, they know that's who I am. If I'm talking to so George, are you okay? Are, are you feeling all right? You remember? And now some individuals who are more conservative use that. Once in a while, speed it up. Don't be too slow. I got to slow it down. You got to speed it up. But still your own personality. Be who you are. Utilize the strengths and weaknesses, your gifts that were given to you, and utilize them to make you a more effective leader. And those areas that you don't have the strengths, take the classes that you're doing now, do your trial and error, work on those areas, and you'll develop them. You may never be that instantly in those your natural gifts, but the other gifts will be pretty good. And then as your leadership, all those skills that we're talking about, attributes, transformation, all you know, the reverent, uh, the charisma, all that will work in your favor. You'll become a better leader. Every day, strive to be more effective. That's all I can tell you. Okay, so now research suggests, here's what the research tells me. I'll do that in bold. Okay, uh, male and female managers in similar leadership position behave in similar ways. They do not engage in more consideration than men. Women don't. And men do not engage more in citing structure than women. So it's a balance. And, you know, when you look at uh, 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 baby boomers, women in my generation, who are the mentor? Men. So they picked up the attributes of a man who was doing the training. Now there's more women not, you know, they're not as many, but I think 40 to 30% they're up there in the uh, 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 supervisory middle levels. You still have to break that uh, uh, top management. But this is even harder for gentlemen. Because remember, the organization used to be real tall. You had a lot of levels, and now they became flatter. So you don't have as many levels. And the, the person's in there, there's more people competing for the jobs. Once you get to the top, they look male, female. They're looking for the skill sets and the uh, attributes and what you could bring in and that you have uh, that experience at that level because you're, you're like at the rudder of a large ship. You're directing the whole organization. Okay, so research does suggest that uh, men and women may differ in their style. I forgot the L, okay? Uh, women uh, tend to be more participated than men in general. Uh, involving uh, subordinates in decision-making, they bring more participating man uh, management, seeking more input, while men, uh, managers, tend to be less participated than the female, unless you come out of sales and marketing, uh, wanting to do things their own way. Remember, a lot of women do that too, and, that, uh, and that's not only maybe men or women, it's just in the United States we're more individualized, you know, uh, our own way. Men tend to be harsher when they punish the subordinates, uh, than women. I found that the opposite, but who am I to say? Okay? Alright, so we have that. Now, what do we have in here? Emerging issues. Well, I got a lot to go on. Not too many. Okay, um, uh, emerging issues in leadership. You have strategic leadership. is leaders' ability to understand complexity of both the organization and its environment. Then you have ethical leadership. You see that with Wells Fargo. You see the ethics in our presidential campaign for both part, for both candidates. I'm looking one way or the other. You know, talking about leaders' behavior to reflect high ethical standards. That's what we're looking for. Maintain high ethical standards. You know, not only reflect them, but maintain them with the organization and themselves. Hold others and accountable in order to the same standard. When you look at the Wells, uh, uh, Wells Fargo Bank, they fired 5,300 employees, 5,300 the last two years for doing all this. They did not fire anyone at the top. Top management, you're the one that sets the culture. You're the one that set the goals. You're the ones that supposedly set the incentives. They sh didn't suffer. Yeah, well, we took of all the people who created the accounts. We didn't know that happened. Come on. 
Let's be realistic. Got so many customers, no one else is making the numbers. Ooh, is, are these right? Who controls? Or did you take out and say, uh, uh, like justice, and put the a veil over? I didn't see. All I'm saying as a leader, you have to be ethical. You could speak all you want. People are looking at your actions. And your employees, if you see this is how the game is played, or they think or perceive this is how the game is played, your code of ethics is null. Because they're going to say, this is what it takes to get ahead. This is what it takes to make George or the organization happy. Remember, not what you say is what you do. Okay? And now virtual leadership, when you're looking at this, uh, leadership in societies where leaders and followers interact uh, electronically rather than a face-to-face setting. Face-to-face -face is the best way to do it. Interaction uh, in a virtual setting, you could have uh, 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 FaceTime or Skype. Yeah, still a person. I don't touch them, but I, I can't. Uh, 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 you know, I can still see them. I can see their facial expression. It's still fairly effective. There's a way of doing it. You know what I mean? But the emails and everything else. So utilize the medium, which is practical, which is the most effective for the situation, for the response, what you're trying to get out. If there's a whole new thing, there's something wrong with discrimination or sexual harassment, you have to talk to that individual. Okay? You may send them a message. We have a meeting coming up. We're talking about this inappropriate behavior or we're doing something in that thing with my employees. I had to do it. So when they come up, they most likely know what's going on. Not to blindside them coming in there, and I don't want to be sarcastic, blindside. Not to uh, uh, hide something for them. It could be insensitive for someone who has visual uh, 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 challenges. I have no problem. All right, all right, glad. Remember, you have to be careful. You have to be sensitive to people. I try to do it. I don't see the individuals out there, and it just comes out. You know, when I'm talking, uh, but I catch myself, I do this as a learning moment. That's what a leader, just like a teacher. He or she makes a mistake, how do I correct it? Here's why it would be great. Here's what the, the rationale for it. Now they become more empowered, they understand your thinking, they understand that is that you, you know, build your trust because you're really looking at their uh, well-being uh, first, okay? All right, so we have that. Okay, now developmental consideration. Behavior in, in a leader engages into support. You have to find those individuals that help people. Right, uh, encourage followers. You have some people that are, you know, when we do the teams, they're the ones that are supportive. Yeah, you could do it. You know, they're not the leader, but hey, you could do it. You see the parents do it at the baseball game. You could do it. Son. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And then you have the other ones. They go, you do it. I'll beat your butt if you don't come back in here and do it. Now those are supportive. Those are threatening. Man, wait till you get home. You get them all. Get out their face. You're, you're, you're. Which one is better? Both are effective. But which one is for the long term that reduces the stress and the individual enjoys working and taking that challenge? Okay? But sometimes you have to do it. It's just, remember, it depends on the situation. You, you have a burning building, you got to tell, you got to jump out the head, jump down the hill. You know, then you call them because you want to force that action for to get the mad, but not an everyday occurrence. You see how the situation works? Okay, so uh, encourage followers to grow on the job and help them develop. Now, the rational decision making model, I think I got uh, assumptions. Okay, come on, let's see, decision. Okay, uh, you can't really read this, but here's the steps. I'm going to look at the steps. Let's look at the steps. Here's the decision-making model. You have um, uh, the step. Recognize and define the nature of the decision situation. What do I want to solve? And it doesn't have to be negative. We want to go to a new market. I think this will work. That's the nature. I found it. You know, positive or negative. Now I've got. Here's what I want to do. I want to get in the market. Or I want to reduce my expense. I want to reduce my qua. Uh, reduce my uh, 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 return. Whatever. There's a problem. I want to solve it. Now, what are my alternatives? Do I have to train my workers, or do I bring a new force, or do I ship out this thing? Or what are my alternatives? So I'm looking at that. So I got the decision. I'm bringing a team. You know, I'm doing individually or, or with a group. Remember, individuals sometimes have better, more effective uh, uh, decisions, but they don't have all the facts. A group takes longer. You have to do a little more compromising, but you have a buy-in. You're not telling them what to do. They more participated in the, the problem, the order problem, so they're going to want to make it work because they have an input. Okay, evaluate the situations and pick the best one. Uh, okay, and then put it into practice, and then you basically do the feedback. And I thought, figure, oh, here it is recognizing, identifying, evaluating, you know, for my visual, selecting, implementing, and choosing. Okay, 
Okay, so now with the other one we have, uh, and, and then this one here is, you know, you could open up later on in your uh, smartphone and you take the one and it tells the manager recognizes the deadline and makes decisions and then it just walks you through. We already went through that uh, in the thing. Okay, now the type of decisions you'll be making is program decisions. We talked a little bit. Decision that is relatively structured or reoccurred with some frequency in both. So if this happens, do this. If that alarm goes, press that button. Your dummy light goes on pull over, find out why it's overheating. Non programmed decisions is you hear a noise and there's no dummy lights. What's going on? Something's going on there, okay? Decisions that are relatively unstructured. Never happened before. I, it doesn't, it's a one in, a, in every 5,000. And sometimes that's, uh, if you're doing a lot of products, you know, billions, then that becomes a routine uh, uh, structure, okay? Or program decision. And occurs with low frequency, not that often. That's for your expertise, your critical thinking, your knowledge, all your other previous uh, uh, experiences, your team, everyone working together, looking at the problem and saying, how do we resolve it? How do we solve it? That's what happens in the ER when you look at the doctors coming in an emergency. They're bringing the people all over. And sometimes something simple that, what's he coming in for? What's this uh, thing? I don't have that. I got a problem here. It's all connected and that may have some kind of uh, effect to be an irritant or something. You remember? Different decisions. This ones here are easy. You have more of a, a, a self-managed team. These here is where you have to have someone to know what happens or someone that's going to make these decisions because there's no rule book, for lack of better words. Okay? And a lot of times they don't have all the uh, information. Okay? Common decision-making biases. Availability bias. Use only information that is readily available from memory to make judgments. I don't look, I know, you know what I mean? This guy, we're not lost. I just throw someplace around here and you're in the wrong town. Okay, confirmation uh, bias. And this one, when people seek information to support their own point of view and discount data that do not. I want it to go this way, so I'm only looking for information to sustain that. Represented uh, a bias. A tendency to generalize from a small sample or single event. This it happened once may never happen again. But I'm biased. I don't know. This really bothered me. I'm going to take care of it. It's a, a fluke of nature, for lack of better words. Okay, now some kind of bias. This is one that, this one here in uh, escalation and commitment should have been close together. Is managers add up all the money already spent in a product and include is too costly to simply abandon. And that's something where you have a lot of individuals when I was going for my doctoral, I finished all my uh, schooling and I had to do my dissertation and there's some conflict between the dean and, and the committee. It's just fine, you know, and I'm going to give it up. But what happened, I was going, wait a minute, I spent all this money and what do I get in return? You had to follow through. But sometimes it comes up as uh, you've spent too much. You may not be as profitable as you estimated, but you're still profitable. This other thing, escalation of commitment biases, you already spent too money, there's no way in heck it's going to be profitable. Let me just uh, move this in here like this. Occurs when decision makers increase their commitment to a project despite negative information about it. You see what I'm talking about? This one, I already spent too much money, but even if I go through it, it's still viable. It may not give me my... 30% return on it can be 50. But if I just give it away, stop it, I'm losing too much money, I'm still making something, let's go through it. This one here is, no matter how much money I put into it, it's just a lemon. It's a piece of junk. Get rid of it. Stop it, lose it, get rid of it, sell it, get your salvage value and leave. Do you see the difference? Now, anchoring and adjustment by it is tendency to make decisions and an initial figure. Just because they say a certain, you know, that's how they sell things. Oh, you're going to lose so much weight. 20%. 20% of what? Only one person? What the heck? Look at the information. Make sure we all have bias. All this lecture, all this, uh, what the author's trying to do, be aware that the biases, some of it we could pick up, some of us in there. When you read that, you start thinking, hmm, maybe it is when you're making those decisions. Okay, decision making conditions. Okay, you know, uh, state certainty. When the decision maker knows what, with what, with, with what reasonable. Sorry. With reasonable certainty, what alternatives are, 
They know, I already know this is gonna, how it's going to come out, what, and what conditions are associated with the, uh, eternity. I like those decisions. I already kind of know what the outcome is going to be. Yeah, sure, you've got the Murphy's Law of 1 in a million, but the majority, you know, i got 90% uh, chances to be effective. You'll state the risk, and when availability of each alternative are well associated with probability. And I always say, some people have to have 100% probability. Academics, a lot of times, 100% before they do something. Not reality, not lifetime. Things will change too much. Most businesses will do it if they have, you know, if I the higher probability of information I have or chances this will happen, higher probability, that's what I want. But a lot of times you're making these uh, a non program decision. I may only have 60, 40, 30% of the information and I have to make the, uh, the, the, the decision in a very timely manner because it's very critical for the rest of the process to uh, go forward. So I may make a decision with 60% of the information. I would rather have 70, 80 or more, but I don't have the time because I have a time constraint. Remember, that's a good leader. That's when you look at your experience, your intuitive, uh, uh, your critical thinking, asking other people, you know, somebody has a sounding board to help you along with that, okay? Now, the uncertainty, uh, state of uncertainty, decision maker does not know all the alternatives. That's where we're usually at. The risks associated with each or likely consequences of each alternative. So you're taking a gamble. You have to start looking at your uh, your uh, experience and your intuitive uh, ability. And you see a lot of people make decisions that uh, worked out uh, well. If I look at uh, what's going on with uh, the, uh, the Federal Reserve, they're trying to do it. You know, they don't have all the information. Everything else going in, there's some information is skewed. And so the uh, Miss Yellen has to go kind of with other individuals and kind of still with that intuitive, that cut feeling. I think this is the way it's going to go. Okay? And she's going to take a game. She's working at the whole uh, economy of the United States. And it could affect worldwide economic. Remember we talked about economics or the flat uh, 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 economic system we all operate, or global, for lack of better words. But affects in China, affects us, what happens to us, affects China and the Middle East. We're one world economic system. We're just going that way. We've got to own micro, but we still have to uh, function in the uh, macro. So remember, think, uh, act, uh, think locally uh, or act locally, but think globally. Okay? Okay, so you have co a coalition. It's a, a, a formal alliance of individuals or groups formed to achieve a common goal. Coalition of stockholders formed together to force board of directors into a certain action that they want the company to go. Okay? Intuition. An intimate belief about something. You just got that gut feeling, often without uh, conscious uh, consideration. I'm just saying, you know, usually you use it as a flag or a warning or something to, you know, to, to look at it closer, but sometimes that's all you have to uh, work on, not the norm hear me not the norm but part of the norm you got the feel it gives you which area to focus in and to look at okay like if look if you lost something you kind of your your critical thing was the last thing i do but then you go i oh, mean i think it's here you had some kind of intuition that's there and you find it sometimes okay so let's see we have that one intuition Okay, now escalation and commitment goes back again here. Condition that the decision maker becomes so committed to a course of action that she or he stays with it even appears to be the wrong course of action. And a lot of times, remember, this escalation commitment, you could, if you look at the research, could tie it to a poor decision made for an individual that did something wrong and they try to hide it when you look at ethics. Most people are very ethical. They hide it and they escalate it, and now it got to so big they can't get rid of it. They have to just stick with it, even though they know I should come clean, I should say this, but it's just, it's too far. I'm, I'm too far into this. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying this is something when you're making a decision. If you made a poor decision, let your team know. Stand up, I messed up, hey. So sometimes you lose your job and, or you lose your faith. It's more of your faith, your self pride that hurts. Been there. Okay, now risk per, uh, propensity, extent to which a decision maker is willing to gamble when making a decision. And it, ta it takes into here, and it takes into the other things uh, when I don't have all the information and all the facts. Okay, so let's see what we have here. Let me come back in here, 
and just for a second i think i handled everything okay so here we are we've covered everything this is an interesting chapter remember leadership i enjoy leadership leadership someplace in your career you have to manage you start off with first line supervisor problems with a lot of first line supervisors starting off is that uh, uh for lack of better words uh, let me just hang on a second let's make this up a little I'm talking remember multitasking most people can't do uh, everything in one time so if i'm looking at a supervisory position it's usually the hardest but look at it this way you have what you have right here and what you could do i'm babbling uh we covered leadership with uh, power what i was trying to say we all want to lead in some cases sometimes we're informal leaders we all make decisions even if you don't want to make a decision you made a decision when you're in that position as a first line supervisor and even an informal leader always look for the best decision if you make a poor decision or if you don't have information tell your team here's where i think we should go if you have new information bring that back to your team you're not wishy-washy when i made the decision here now i have this bit of information let's do a course change you have to change everything remember when you make a decision with the rationale model they always say you should have two or three alternatives if your first alternative is not working properly and something's not going right it's not exactly it's not course or it's off course but it's not exactly to the target or the smart goals that you uh objectives that you already uh, uh established uh for this uh, uh event to occur what do you do do you start from scratch no you look at your second best option and see what parts I could put into this to change that course of action. This could have been the next option, so now I start combining it. I start being flexible. I start adjusting. That's the skill sets of a leader. And how do I bring the team in with the expertise? It, remember, it's like a spoke wheel. When you look at a wheel, I can't change too much. I still have the rim. I have to get another spoke. I could get a thicker spoke. I could get a yellow spoke. But if I do a, a longer spoke because it doesn't fit into the confinement of the whole process or the outcome, I'm going to have a bowl shape. It's not going to wobble. So I have to be able to fit in the boundaries of what makes sense that uh, uh, for the situation that I'm trying to resolve or the situation or a new market or the opportunity I'm trying to expand or uh, develop it could be individuals it could be a product it could be the company it could be a department all right so leadership try to be you, you need your remember you got your legitimate your uh, what you're trying to strive in if you have to you know the uh, you've got the legitimate uh, they gave you the title and then you had the reward and you had the punishment and now you have the expertise you have the reverence you have the charisma you have the critical thinking you're a good communicator and you've got the skill sets you know at least some traits now when you have all that that what makes you a very strong effective leader but when you're starting off you know the legitimate uh, and reward power is a good starting off when people listen to you but as you grow in your organization that's what bring it that brings people together and it'll make the organization strong again my name is dr george machaki and i hopefully a little bit over on this but leadership is very important ladies you're just as powerful and just as effective leaders as men men you're just as effective as women and you're not just all directive and, and women you're not all emotional we are there's a balance there's something at one extreme to the other but you're just as effective and we utilize both skill sets okay look at the situation look at your employees you have to remember we talked about before you have to understand your employees how to motivate them and part of that when we talked here when we looked at uh, 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 situational approach or an uh, employee focus uh, approach uh, we basically understand our employees and we know how to get them to work together you're that common denominator you're the glue that keeps the department the company the team the family the culture together again my name is dr george machaki we'll see you in the next session thank you